Have you ever heard of the term eco-anxiety, plant friend? It's a word that is becoming more and more popular. I'm hearing it more and more as we stare at our climate crisis and how it's affecting both our gardens and our lives. So the American Psychology Association describes eco-anxiety as the chronic fear of environmental cataclysm that comes from observing the seemingly irrevocable impact of climate change and the associated concern with one's future and of the next generations. As we connect to our plants and our gardens, we are also connecting to the earth, and it makes total sense that people who are gardening are probably going to experience eco-anxiety because we care about the earth, because we're part of it, right? So today we're dedicating an entire episode to talking about this concept, how to identify it, how to know if it's something you're suffering from, and how to treat it with nature. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. my plant friends. Welcome back. If you're a recurring listener, hello. It's so good to have you back. I am so honored to be a part of your journey into plant parenthood and connecting with nature. If you're new here, hi, I'm Maria. I'm your new best plant friend and I help people care for plants successfully and grow joy in their life by doing so. What's the opposite of joy? Anxiety. Eco-anxiety. I feel like Some people have probably not even heard this term before, but it's a term that's coming up. It's being talked about a lot more. And my friend Raquel, who is a repeat guest on this podcast, you might have heard her episode on using nature to cultivate your intuition, maybe how to be a green witch. She was in our recent spring equinox episode, but she is an intuitive healer who is so connected with nature and the elements. And she just came out with this incredible book, Self-Care for Eco-Anxiety, that talks all about this problem that is arising for so many of us. And we have such a great conversation about what is eco-anxiety? How do we treat it? Why is this important? And it just makes so much sense as we all come into our own nature-based awakening that we are nature. Of course, there's going to be anxiety that arises. So I hope this episode provides support. It's not a traditional plant care episode, but I hope it provides you support and perspective as we move into the gardening season, as we get outside more, as we connect with nature more as we're in spring and summer. And I hope you like this conversation as much as I did. Raquel, welcome back. You're basically a monthly guest at this point. (laughs) I love it. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, I mean, I tell you all the time, I love talking with you, Maria. Love it. Any excuse for us to talk about plants and magic and nervous system regulation, I will take. I'm so excited to talk to you today, Raquel, because this is a concept I don't have a lot of experience with, but I know a lot of people do. I know it's something very personal to you. This concept of eco-anxiety, as we're talking more and more about global warming, and it just feels so helpless sometimes. So can we start with what is eco-anxiety? This is a word that's getting talked about a lot more. What is it? What does it mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the best place to start, right? Like to define what it is. So eco-anxiety is a term that actually the American Academy of Psychiatrics have come out with now. And it's basically an existential fear or dread about the future because of environmental destruction, climate change, things like that. Now, when I was experiencing my own journey with eco-anxiety, we used a different term called ecophobia, which is basically fear of the environment. But I think eco-anxiety describes it better than ecophobia does because we're not afraid of the environment. We're afraid of what we're doing to the environment, right? Right. Or how the environment might betray us eventually. Yeah. Well, as we've betrayed it, yes. As we've betrayed it. Yes, totally. 1000%. So when we think about eco-anxiety, it's more than just the feelings of anxiety. It's also the feelings of rage, of anger at our leadership, at our corporations for not doing better when it comes to protecting the environment. It's also the feelings of overwhelm and even apathy that we can feel that keeps us from actually taking action as well. So like a lot of things, when we think about anxiety, it encapsulates more than just a feeling of anxiousness. There is 
rage, there is fear, there is overwhelm, there is even a bit of paralysis all wrapped up in that one term, eco-anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I'm at the age where me and my friends are all family planning and, you know, having babies or discussing whether or not we're going to have babies. And I can't tell you how many times people are considering whether or not to have children based off of the climate crisis and what kind of world their kids are going to have to take care of. I don't think any other generation has really thought about it that way before. That's a very next level of anxiety. Yeah, I agree. And I know I have two children and I know that with my husband and I, we were very clear that we only wanted two because for us, that feels like we're not increasing the population amount. We're just kind of in that place of like replacing ourselves at some point. But I understand when people are deciding that perhaps they don't want to have children at all. I can completely understand that. And I think one thing that's really important for us to express around eco-anxiety is that for anyone who's listening who has experienced eco-anxiety or who is currently experiencing feelings of anxiety or overwhelm or confusion or rage regarding how we're taking care of this planet, please know that that's actually a really sane response for what society is doing, which what we're doing as a society is an insane action. What we're doing as a society is unsustainable, illogical, and insane. And so for those of us who are aware of this, having this emotional reaction is actually a very valid and sane response to what we see happening. So I just want to start with that. (laughs) You're not alone if you're feeling this way. You're not, quote unquote, wrong. I don't even like using that term for feeling this way. There's nothing wrong with you for feeling this way. You're feeling this way because you're paying attention and because you know it doesn't have to be like this and that we can change this. And I think that's what's important for us to note and why it's actually really important for us to talk about eco-anxiety. Because the eco-anxiety we're experiencing is actually keeping us in the same systems that got us to where we're at. And that's where we can talk about nervous system stuff, Maria. (laughs) Yeah. What about your personal experience with eco-anxiety? Can you kind of talk about when you identified it, even if it used to be called ecophobia, and kind of how it's grown within you and how you've grown to manage it? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I've been on the show before. You all know some of my backgrounds uh, with just nature and how nature has always been this beautiful place of restoration, magic, connection, divinity for me. When I was, when was it? 2007. So I was like 26, 27. I went to get my master's at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. I was getting a master's in marine biodiversity and conservation. And it was like this one intense year-long program specifically for people who were already working in the environmental field who wanted to have more resources, more education to bring it back out into the field. And the way that a lot of this was presented to us was through a lot of what we consider doom and gloom. Let's just teach everyone about how bad everything is, how shitty it is, how much we're destroying the oceans, ocean acidification plastic pollution, how our current systems are just keeping this in place. And I, I fell like I just spiraled downward. It was my first time really having intense, acute anxiety. And the first way it hit me was that I would start waking up at like 4am, just like waking up like, <gasps> like with this like gasp and not being able to fall back to sleep. And then I lost my appetite completely. I lost like 20 pounds because I had no appetite because I had these racing thoughts in my head all the time about how bad everything was. And for me, instead of it being inspiring of like, this is bad, we need to make this change. It was like, it had me feeling like, what's the point? What's the point? If it's this bad, can we even shift this? Can we even change this? Like for me, it really made me feel like uh, I should just give up and figure out how to live a little life until we all die. Like it was, it was bad. Yeah. I think some people experience that though, where they're like, does my recycling even count? Like, does it even, does do the small shifts and changes that I make even count? And of course the answer is yes. And it's funny, the episode that airs right before this episode is on composting. And I have a very similar conversation with that guest about does composting in my little home and just saving my little food scraps do anything? And the answer is, of course it does. But it's totally a thought that a lot of people have when you just feel so overwhelmed. It's easier to just check out and be like, no, it doesn't. I'm just going to throw everything in the garbage, you know? Yep. Yep. And actually, this whole book is basically like, yeah, the little things you do do matter. 
the way you feel about what you do matters, right? Like that's what this whole book is. So I completely agree with you. So anyway, I, at that time, I went to therapy like through the school. They put me on anti-anxiety medication, sleep medication. I got through the program. And of course, being in the program, once we got past some of like the doom and gloom and we actually were in the action part, that kind of helped. And then I started, um, I got a job at Monterey Bay Aquarium, working there in environmental education, writing curriculum. The aquarium was a lot more about presenting solutions, being very like kind of activist oriented. So that really helped a lot of my feelings of eco-anxiety. But when I had my second daughter, when she was about six, no, like 10 months old, the, the anxiety came back really strong. And I'm sure it had something to do with like postpartum stuff too, but it came back really strong. I started having panic attacks at night when everyone was sleeping and I couldn't sleep. And I was just petrified about the future for my children and then just petrified because I felt like, why can't I get out of this? <laughs> so, and then I've, I've shared my story many times of how plants came in and creativity with plants and how it changed everything for me. But that was my experience with eco-anxiety was the sense of, I can look at the world and see its beauty, but as soon as I saw it and could like feel the beauty, I would immediately turn that off and be like, no, it's fucked. Like it might look beautiful on the surface, but actually everything is hurt and wounded beneath, right? Everything is actually terrible if we look a little bit deeper. That's where I was living for like years, years. I feel like so many of these interviews that I've been doing lately and also just conversations I'm having in my personal life are all about just the concept of perspective and how <sighs> perspective is the magic of living a happy life. Like you can choose to view the doom and gloom or you can choose to say, OK, I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to help fix things. But the perspective is so important. I mean, even when you look at your garden, is it a plant failure? Is it a learning opportunity, right? Am I going to look at this? Is it, you know, the classic glass of water is half full or half empty? I feel like this is also kind of one of those opportunities to either let it completely paralyze you, like what we've talked about, not recycling, not composting, not doing anything, not allowing yourself to even access the awe of the beauty. Exactly. Or deepening into it, rooting even deeper into it in order to do something and actually allow it to help you feel good. Yes. Why do you think this all matters? Ugh. I mean, I think you kind of just hit the nail on the head with what you were sharing. It all matters is because first and foremost, we cannot separate our health as humans from the health of the planet. I think it's really important that we state that like over and over again. Whatever we do to the air, the water and the soil we do to our physical being who breathes air, drinks water, and eats food grown in the soil, first and foremost. So even if we go into a place of wanting to rectify and resolve, remedy some of the ways that we're currently treating the environment, if we do it from a place of fear, rage, paralysis, or I mean, if it's paralysis, we're not going to do anything. But like, if we're doing it from this place of like anxiety and fear, we're going to be doing it in a way that's actually affecting our health negatively, which is going to be an impacted on the environment as well. So if we can come to a place where we can come back to a place of connecting with the environment in a ways that benefit our health and wellness, when we can come back to a place of feeling into our relationship with earth and nature from a place of love and connection and reciprocity, we're going to be acting for earth in ways that we would just act for anyone we love, because that's what love is is that beautiful give and take. And we all know we're taking from earth. We can't not take. We are consumers. It is what we are. That being said, we are meant to give back to earth in return. Right now we are giving back to earth, but most of what we're giving back to earth is um, pretty toxic. But we can give back to earth in ways that are organic, that are restorative, that are regenerative. And that's really where the conversation is going now. And I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, like when you talk about Earth as Mother Nature, it's like you'd never let your mom just like deteriorate in the hospital, you know, or like you'd never treat your own parent or your own family member the way a lot of us have. And here's the other thing. A lot of us have really unknowingly done a lot of the damage, too. So I don't want this episode to be like, everybody sucks, like get your act together. Oh, not at all. Yeah, because I think. I mean, at least for me, when I kind of woke up to my ignorance, having never composted, having never really recycled, having never really done any of these things when I was living in the city, when you wake up to it, there's also a lot of shame around yeah. what you haven't done for however yes. many years you lived on the planet, right? And yes. once again, when you go into that perspective, it's like, yeah, you can focus on what you didn't do, or you can just commit to doing one small thing 
a little bit different? Or can you view this in a different way? Or can you take one more step to looking at the earth as something that you can take care of and give back to instead of just not care about or just not see, right? I feel like so many of the conversations on this podcast are about like learning to see the earth as nature, learning to see plants as living things, learning to interact with them and feel them and tune into them. And and that this conversation about eco-anxiety and healing it is kind of the next step. If you've listened to the podcast or followed me on socials, you know that my Wind River wind chimes have been the underscoring to my life for the last couple of years. I love that they are constant reminders to drop into the present moment whenever their chimes drift through my home, through my windows, and they've basically turned my home into a spa. I am so excited to announce the new Wind River Eclipse collection of chimes, launching in conjunction with the Great North American Eclipse occurring on April 8th, 2024. This ad is actually being under scored by new original music using the Eclipse Collection chimes by the Shane Flying Sun Tapes, which you can find on any major music streaming service. Unlike any other Wind River chimes ever made, this limited edition collection of uniquely tuned Corinthian bells are tuned to the Lydian mode, a unique scale which creates an ethereal atmosphere of enchantment that matches the mystery and wonder of the solar eclipse and of outer space. The Eclipse Collection is available in three sizes, the 30 inch, which sounds like this, the 50 inch, which sounds like this, and the epic 78 incher. If you're hearing this ad before the eclipse on April 8th, you can make these wind chimes the soundtrack of your eclipse if you order by March 29th. And if you're hearing this ad after April 8th, get yourself a chime from the Eclipse Collection or any other collection on windriverchimes.com to add some mystery, enchantment, and beauty to your home and garden. As always, code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com will get you a free engraving on any engravable wind chime. All wind chimes make amazing gifts or a special gift to yourself. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds. So head to windriverchimes.com to listen and learn, and don't forget to use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout. If you're feeling called to reconnect with the earth and maybe even add homesteading to your list of hobbies, you should totally check out the new book, Simple Country Living by Annette Thurman. So this book, Simple Country Living, is a practical guidebook focused on the garden and kitchen know-how with recipes, tips, tricks, and family activities to help you reduce waste, save money, and harness new skills in the garden and beyond. You'll learn how to create a natural and nature-inspired home indoors and out. And in addition to learning the essentials for gardening, you'll learn how to preserve your harvest, which is my new goal for this upcoming year, embrace garden-to-table eating with seasonal recipes, reduce food waste, learn how to stock a resilient homestead pantry, make DIY cleaning sprays, natural egg dyes, and so much more. It's got everything. Every single project you could imagine embarking on, it's got. No matter where you live or what skills you already have, the Simple Country Life can be more than just a state of mind. Check it out for yourself. Grab Simple Country Living by Annette Thurman. I freaking love the title of that book, Simple Country Living, at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's Simple Country Living by Annette Thurman. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that you share there that I agree with. One thing that's really important to note, and I hope I make this very clear in self-care for eco-anxiety, is that while the book presents self-care practices that will reduce your your footprint on Earth or your like negative environmental footprint on Earth, like that's not what the point of this book is, right? Like, and while this book presents certain self-care practices that are going to when done in large scale, have a really good impact on what's happening in the environment and climate change. Again, that's not what the point of this book is. The point of this book is to bring you back into a place of loving relationship with earth and with yourself. Because one of the things you and I talk about a lot, Maria, is that our relationship with earth and nature is very much a mirror with our relationship with our own soul, right? And that we can really utilize our relationship with earth, with nature, as a portal back into our own soul, our own authenticity, our own infinite nature, who we truly are. Earth, nature, that has always been that pathway back home to ourselves. That's what I've always believed. That's what I feel. That's true for me. And I think for a lot of people listening, that's probably true for them as well. 
And I agree with you that there can be a level of shame and guilt when we first feel into, oh, wow, like these actions, the waste we create, whatever it might be is having an impact on the environment. What I want to share with that, though, is that it's not the responsibility of any single person to solve these issues. And unfortunately, I have to say that this kind of methodology of pushing all the action onto the consumer was actually a ploy of the oil corporations. (laughs) And I remember like early 2010s, You can go online and you could do your own carbon footprint calculator. Do you remember those things? I don't know. Mm -hmm. That was something we were doing at the aquarium. Like you can go in and be like, I have this many cars and we drive this many miles. And it could be like, here's your carbon calculator. That was not actually, that was actually created by like the plastics and oil petroleum companies to try and kind of absolve themselves from their own responsibility and push all of it onto us as the consumer. Yes. I believe when it comes to our relationship to the environment, climate change, environmental destruction, it's going to be a bottom up and a top down. We need both. This idea of it coming just from the population isn't going to work with the way that governments and corporations currently have things created. Like the corp, we have to get businesses and corporations and those people who are actually producing so much of the waste involved. It can't just be pushed onto us and the consumers. But what we can do as the people and as the consumers is to, quote, you know, vote with our dollar. That, again, brings in issues of classism and other things. But we can be aware of what do we really need? How can we get it for ourselves? How can we create more community? How can we start growing some of our own food, right? Like There are ways we can kind of separate ourselves from these systems. And by doing so, let the systems know we need you to change, right? And I think the book helps you do some of that. But again, the shame and the guilt is not, (laughs) from the standpoint of energy medicine, it's not authentic emotion. It's mental projected emotion that's coming from societal conditioning. So I think it's really important that we state that and note that because that shame that we feel is impacting the nervous system, is impacting how we feel about our relationship to earth. And we want to come back to a place of feeling that reciprocal relationship of love and generosity and abundance and reciprocity. So, yeah. Beautiful. When it comes to the nervous system, I mean, obviously the anxious part is, so the symptoms of eco-anxiety, you've kind of mentioned fear, rage, shame, sadness, all centered around kind of the future of the earth's well-being those feelings are obviously going to put us into the fight or flight, right? And how do we move ourselves back into the rest and digest the happy place? Yes. Oh, I love this question. I just want to state a little bit more on that because I think we hear a lot with the nervous system about like the sympathetic fight or flight versus the parasympathetic rest or digest. But when we're talking about the nervous system, the sympathetic is our more action oriented, like, We're going to take action in life, which when we're in a stressed place, it does lead to this energy of fighting something or fleeing from it, running away from it. The parasympathetic is more of that rest or digest. But when it's in its space of dealing with stress, it will lead to what we call fawn, which is very much people pleasing and overwhelm or freeze, which is depression, apathy, paralysis. So we can get stuck on either side of those aspects of our nervous system. And what we want to do is be able to kind of regulate and titrate and move between them. So often when we think about eco-anxiety, if we're in that place of fear or rage, we're going to be talking about the sympathetic. And in fact, one of some of the first self-care practices I share in the book are all about how can we actually move through this feeling of anger that we feel about to governments and businesses for them putting profits and before people and planet and all those things. Like, can we actually allow ourselves to feel that anger, feel that rage, express it, process it, instead of just like holding it inside? Because you just mentioned that, like, what would be a healthy way to meet? Because I think instead of bypassing the emotion to actually meet it and release it, what would be a healthy way to do that? So let's say we're doing with rage. Okay, like, let's say we're just feeling a lot of rage against governments around businesses around the plastic lobby, you know, like all of it, right? There's a lot of ways we can release rage. You can use a pillow, scream into a pillow, hit her pillow. One of my favorite ways is to actually go outside 
You can stand near a tree or near plants. And I do this thing where I kind of tighten up like every from my feet all the way to the top of my head, tighten and squeeze and let myself feel that anger and squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it. And then I just let it go. And as I let it go, I imagine all that anger leaving my body and going down into earth. Now, I know if some people have said to me, I don't want earth to take my anger. That's not fair. I don't want to give earth my shit, you know, but like, what is compost? <laughs> you know? Like what, what does earth do with organic matter? That's waste. She has the beautiful reciprocal symbiotic relationships with fungi and bacteria and all kinds of things to turn that waste into growth material again. So as you're releasing into earth, you can imagine yourself emotionally composting, just letting that anger, letting that rage go into earth, knowing earth will alchemize that back into energy for action, energy for life, right? So, and you can do that a few times. I typically do that like squeezing, tightening, uh, anger feeling like three or four breaths until when I try and squeeze and tighten, I'm like, oh, I don't feel that charge anymore. So that's like a really easy, good one. And you can do it outside. You could do it inside. That's a good one for rage. If you're feeling a lot of fear, I know this might seem really counterintuitive, but like actually letting yourself run in place really, really fast. Let yourself go through that. I'm actually fleeing. Like let your body actually go through that full practice of it and then be like, oh, how do I feel on the other end? Another great one for flight in particular is if you're, you can use a wall if you're inside, but if you're outside and you have a tree, I love doing this with a tree, but like pushing against a tree as hard as you can, like pushing back is a really good one to also kind of get some of those energies of fleeing or even some of those energies of feeling brave enough to turn around and face the thing you're fleeing from, right? So these are some somatic practices to let the body actually feel and digest these emotions as opposed to holding them tight inside, which leads to trauma in the body. Yeah festering and that like horrible 3 a.m. wake up. Yep. For me, it's usually four to five, but yep, hundred <laughs> percent. So those are more in like the sympathetic side of the nervous system. If we're doing things that are more like for freeze or fawn, when we're in fawn, which is really that people pleasing place, when we're kind of like, we're putting our own needs aside for other people's. I love doing a practice for fawning. And I do this next to either my bigger house plants or a tree outside where I imagine myself as a seed. And then as I breathe, I grow and I get bigger and bigger and bigger and just let myself feel as if I'm taking up as much space as the tree. So just feel myself take up space. It's okay to take up space. And I like to use the metaphor of the trees and plants. So like really imagining myself as I'm stretching upwards, imagining my energetic roots growing into ground and really stretching as the rest of me stretches outward and just taking up more space. Those are some examples. I have more examples in the book, but the first five practices in this book are really about working with the nervous system and providing some somatic practices that either have you imagining your relationship with nature or have you actively in nature doing these somatic practices to help you feel like you can hold more of this charge in your body? Yeah, the taking up space one reminds me back in my my performing days when I was auditioning, I would power pose before I went into the audition. And there's all sorts of scientific, there have been so many studies done on power posing and confidence and literally power posing is taking up space. It's very similar. So I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. That's kind of the same thing. But I love that visual of becoming a tree and spreading to the light and allowing the light to maybe be more positivity and working your way kind of up the ladder of those emotions so that sometimes I feel like just finding neutrality is such a gift. It's like not that we're even going to be so positive, but even just to find neutrality and not have the anxiety anymore can be such a win, you know? So even just getting all of that out so you can just feel no charge instead of expecting a positive charge, you know, because I think for a lot of us, that's probably going to be harder. In your book, you talk about this mother tree. I I just wanted to say, I love what you shared about acceptance and like that neutrality. I think it's really important because I think, again, we're not trying to say ignore reality. Like the reality at play is this is shitty. You know what I mean? Like the reality at play is that we have to change our ways. The reality is like things need to change, right? But that being said, we can still 
go outside and be like, wow, it's gorgeous out. Look at the flowers blooming. Look at the birds singing. Look at the sun shining. Like all of that is still true and is still existing and it still has beautiful energy for us to take in right here and now. And in fact, being able to do that, being able to open to that energy of what is here right now is what we need to actually help us move into the action we need to take for the future. So yeah, really important. Totally. I love it. In your book, you talk about the mother tree. And I love this because also earlier when you were talking about how one person is not going to solve the problem, it is going to be a communal experience from the top down, from the bottom up, but also we are going to solve this in community. And there's this beautiful chapter on the mother tree in your book. Will you tell us a little bit more about this kind of, I don't know if it's a theory or the idea of the mother tree? Yeah. I mean, I think it's scientific fact at this point. There's this beautiful book called Finding the Mother Tree by Dr. Susan Samard. Yes. Suzanne Samard. Love her. Love her so much. So that's where I really got this concept. I don't think she's the only forest ecologist who came to this conclusion through their research, but that's the book I read. So (laughs) that's who I know it from. I used to talk about the book, The Overstory, so much. It's one of my favorite books. And I'm pretty sure one of the main characters in The Overstory, which is fiction, is based off of Suzanne Samard as well. I'm pretty sure. Oh. Anyway, I digress. I'm not sure. I also, I was listening to that book and I didn't get all the way through. But isn't that like little vignettes of different people in that book? Yes, but it's the vignettes carry throughout the entire book. Okay, I had to finish it. And she's one of the main, yeah. Oh gosh, it was so good. Anyway, Suzanne Samard, The Mother Tree. <laughs> I digress. Back on, back on track. That would make sense. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So she was an ecologist who actually worked for the forestry system in Canada. So she was working for the businesses that were cutting down trees. And her role was to try and help them replant baby trees and have those grow really fast. And in her research, she was finding that like the trees they were planting were not growing as quickly as they expected them to. And so she was trying to figure out like what's going on here. And so she, of course, being an ecologist was like, what's going on in the root system? Because that is what's going to govern how plants are growing. And the way that the forestry services were working was like plant as much of the tree we want as possible and get rid of everything else because everything else is competing with the trees we actually want. That's what their initial thought was. But what Suzanne found in her research was that this is actually worse for the forest and it's creating a situation with a lack of biodiversity that's making it hard for these trees to grow. And anyway, long story short, she discovered that forests communities are not in competition as much as they are in community and collaboration. And the way that they collaborate is through an interconnected root system called the mycelium network, which is interconnected fungi and bacteria that create these lace-like structures that connect the roots of different plants with each other and share information and resources. And what she discovered is that in the forests, in healthy forest ecosystems, there are larger, older trees that become these hubs of information and resources for the trees around them. And they are the mother trees and they can send extra water, resources, chemical information, which is communication to other trees. They can tell the difference between trees that that are their actual progeny, like their children versus other species of plants and trees. And they can make a choice in like leaner years to divert that extra resources just to their own progeny. But most of the time in a healthy forest system, they're sending resources and receiving resources from the whole community. But it's these mother trees that are kind of like the central hubs of this information and sending out most of the additional resources. And it's just, for me, it was so confirming to read about this, to recognize that this idea of it all being competition did never sat right with me because it wasn't accurate that in fact we're all interconnected and that cre- that is seen in the forest systems and well, as well and yes while there is some forms of commu- of competition in terms of sunlight and resources in truth is there it's com- it's a community and they are interconnected they're in relationship with each other they care about each other. They're sentient beings, these plants, and they know they're in community. And that when we try and strip it away and create a situation where we're only trying to grow one species, the community suffers and the species itself can't grow as well as it would have if we had let the biodiversity remain. So 
the mother tree is this beautiful reminder for us that we are meant to live in community, in collaboration, interconnected, and that when we do so, we provide more thriving for our whole community, for our whole forest. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I mean, it's a metaphor on so many different levels because obviously, like what you said, in community, also it makes me think about the dispersal of information, having these like elders or knowledge holders about any topic, but even this concept, right? Global warming, climate change, educating people and supporting people who don't know to learn and and grow stronger. And I think that's so interesting. And then it goes to another topic that you talk about in your book and that you and I have talked about at length on multiple podcasts is the mycelium network and how they even work in community with fungi, which are a completely different kingdom, but that they work in community and these fungi, these my, the mycelium network actually is what helps transport sugars and waters and whatever they need. Like they're the transportation vehicle between these trees, which also I feel like when talking about how this problem is going to get solved at a global level, where this mycelium network of people who are taking the right next step to bring more equilibrium back to the planet, to bring more positivity back to the planet. And I'm curious from like a gardener's perspective, from a houseplant parent's perspective, your book has like 60, 50 exercise, 52 exercises. 52, one for every week of the year. Right. So for people who are tending their gardens, people who are tending their houseplants, what are some beautiful actions then that we can take to give back to Mother Nature, to soothe ourselves while soothing her? You know, obviously composting, we just had a whole episode on composting. So go listen to that. That I feel like is very low hanging fruit. But what else can we leave with a couple of different practices that people might want to try in their gardens or with their house plants this week? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to tell you, if you are tending to a garden, if you're tending to house plants, you are already giving back to earth. Just the fact that you have house plants and are caring for them and tending to them and having that reciprocal relationship is already an act of giving back to yourself and to earth. And just because you have a garden and you care for it. I can't even tell you the physical benefits of gardening. Like there's so many physical health benefits of gardening. And then of course the mental and emotional and energetic benefits and what you're doing for the planet as well. So when it comes to things like gardening at home, whether you're in outdoors or indoors, the first and foremost, you can look at the fertilizers and pesticides you're using um, and really go for cleaner, greener, organic options. Every now and then we might need to use something more systemic. We, I know you've had lots of conversations on your podcast about this, Maria. You've educated a lot about that so people can listen. And I'm sure there's a lot of resources you have on the podcast for that. But one of the things I like to do is really strictly only use organic fertilizers. I'm very, very <laughs> sparing with any form of pesticides. I tend to go for Castile soaps and like neem oil and things like that first and foremost before doing anything that might have to be stronger than that. I'm also okay with a certain amount of pests as long as they're not pestilent, I guess. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a certain amount of just acceptance for it. So that there is one way. Another thing that you can do, especially if you're an outdoor gardener, pollinator gardens. Oh my goodness. Like pollinator gardens are going to be so powerful. And especially when we think about like butterflies, for example, like the monarch who are migratory species, having these little habitats spread throughout the globe that is safe for them actually makes a big impact. So what we do in our gardens, especially for migratory species, makes a big impact. So making sure that you stop using pesticides, herbicides, in your outdoor gardens, especially if you're trying to call in pollinators, things that could affect the bees, the butterflies, some of the birds, that would be huge. And then just creating an invitation for these species that are beneficial, not just for your own garden, but for the world at large, creating that invitation in your own space for them. And I have two different practices in the book about creating pollinator gardens. One is just like planting a pollinator garden and the other is going a little kamikaze and creating these, I call them wildflower seed bombs that you can like throw in empty fields and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so you can get a little like, totally. I've made those before. So fun. So fun to do with kids as well. Yeah. Urban gorilla gardening. Oh my God. So fun with kids. Also birds. I know you love birds, Maria. I love birds as well. 
I actually have a whole episode, I believe next month coming out. So make sure you're subscribed plant friends, but we have a whole episode on bird friendly gardening. It's one of the funnest interviews I've done all year, all about how to attract more bird species to your garden. I mean, there's so much we can do. There's so much, right? Even if you're not a gardener, even if you're just a houseplant parent, you probably have a window box. You probably have a little balcony. Maybe you have a local community garden you can go to, but there's so much that you can do by just planting a a few pollinator plants or eliminating your food scraps or, or doing something more productive with your food scraps than just throwing them in the garbage. Like there really is, there are so many actions you can take to give back. And in urban areas now too, in cities and places like that now too, you, there's so many community gardens. So even if you're not composting in your own place, you can maybe even gather up compost and bring it to one of these community gardens that is composting. Sometimes even schools are doing that as well. So another thing you can do is there's more and more waste management companies that are taking your compost as green waste. So you can also petition your whatever your regional waste management is to be like, hey, we want to be able to provide compost along with the green waste, because a lot of the waste management is realizing, first of all, not only do we have to do this because it's going to be better for the environment, but there's actually an economic incentive for them to do it as well. Because if we can create nice, clean, healthy soil, that's going to be good because soil health is another big, big issue when we're talking about the health of the planet. And that's why composting is so important and also why the mycelium network is so important. And being able to do things like companion planting, being aware of the plants you're planting and being biodiverse with what you're choosing to plant as well has a big impact. Yeah. So those are some things we can do for Mother Earth. And then if we are struggling with eco-anxiety, if we do get hit with a pang of eco-anxiety, let's wrap up with one. What's your favorite practice in the bo- in the book for bringing yourself back down out of an eco-anxiety spiral? Okay. I'm going to answer that question and then I want to answer, I want to share just a little something about the book as well. Okay. So my favorite practice from the book for, I mean, I honestly, it's, it's going to be the mother tree one. So I mentioned like what the mother tree is, but what I share in the book is that we as humans actually have our own mother trees. So there's like the biological mother tree in the forest, but then there's like our energetic mother trees, which are those trees that just speak to us. I don't know about, and you know about you, Maria, but for all of you who are listening, like I have favorite trees on my walks, on my property, the ones that I, that are just like louder to me, the ones that I feel a strong connection with. These are our mother trees. And so what I share in the book is this guided meditation to basically connect in with one or all of your mother trees all at once energetically and to just breathe with them and then ask them to send the guidance to you ask them to send any messages, any wisdom, because trees are wise. They are sentient. They are old. They are wise. And when there is a tree that we feel an affinity for, it's because that tree also has an affinity for us. So we can be aware of that and really call upon their sentience, their consciousness, and bring it into our own daily experience. So that's something I do often, like really often, like probably daily. (laughs) And then the other thing I wanted to share briefly about the book, just to talk a little bit about its structure, is that when it comes, like if you are feeling really eco-anxious, what I suggest before you go into, I have to do some kind of action that's going to be better for the planet, I would suggest first connecting, which is why I'd say mother tree, the mother tree practice is my favorite before we go into a place of giving back, and this is the way I've structured the book, we first want to connect and create that co-creative relationship again. So the way this book is structured is I first just kind of define what is eco-anxiety? Why is it a problem? And then I share 52 nature-based self-care practices, but those are divided into three larger themes. The first 18 are all about connecting with earth again, bringing back the awareness of this relationship we have with earth. So this is where we talk about nervous system, the mother tree. I even have a guided meditation for connecting with the mycelium network, which is another thing I love to do. Yeah, love it. One of the practices for the connection is also connecting with your indigenous roots understanding what are the indigenous roots of the land you currently live on? What are your own indigenous roots? Because all humans have some form of indigeneity as well, right? So even that is a form of connection. 
I think that's really important because it's important for us to note that humans have been able to and actually lived for thousands and thousands of years in relationship, in sacred relationship and harmony with Earth. And it's important for us to remember that as we're moving forward, right? Then the second half of the book is all about co-creating with Earth. So this is your biophilic design, styling with plants, gardening, making art, thing like flower crowns like you love. I know I don't have this one in here, but I have like plant arrangements, herbal teas, like really even cooking, like cooking with more plants, right? Like all of this is co-creating with nature. And then the final section of the book, the final 18 practices are giving back. This is composting, planting a pollinator garden, providing the habitat for birds, things like that. But I really suggest that people start off with connecting and co-creating because then you're in a place of love, of possibility, of health and wellness and like expansion. And from there, it's really easy to go into a place of giving back without falling back into patterns of anxiety or fear or overwhelm or shame or guilt or any of that. Yeah, even the energy of like planting the pollinator garden from a space of gratitude, receptivity, collaboration is very different than planting a pollinator garden from a place of if I don't do this, the world's going to end or if I don't do this, I'm the worst person or if I don't do this, you know, I'm not doing enough. Like those are two very different containers, probably. One thing in your book that I loved that I actually had been thinking about, I visited my friend last week in Seattle She has elements of nature all throughout her house. Like she has garlands of leaves that she has made strung throughout her house. She has pine cones and moss on her mantle. She has just dried flowers everywhere. And it's stuff that she just gets on her walk with her kid and brings it back. But she has turned nature into such art in her home in such a reverent way. And I was like, gosh, I want to do more of this when I get back because it's just such a nice way of living with nature that's beyond houseplants. Like for me, I have so many houseplants in my house, but I don't have garlands of dried flowers, you know, hanging over my door frame. Or a really cool stick in the corner. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Which is another chapter of your book. But for me, that's what I'll pledge at the end of this episode. That's definitely one of the steps that I'm looking to incorporate more because I also feel like if you see nature more, like if I see these dried flowers and these sticks, I'm just going to be thinking about the earth more. And that's also just so important in terms of that connection side. So you spoke a little bit about the book. What's the title? Where can you get it? Tell us everything. Yeah. Okay. So the title of the book is Self-Care for Eco-Anxiety. And then it has a long subtitle, 52 Weekly Practices for Positive Personal Change Through the Power of Nature. The book is out now and you can find it pretty much wherever books are sold. Barnes and Noble.com, Amazon.com, Target.com. There's, I think, also like Book Hub. Some of, so if you want more indie options as well, you can find it there. You can also find it on my website if you like signed copy of books. I have signed copies of all my books. You can get through my website as well. And my website is rinfinitenature.co. You can find me on Instagram at rinfinitenature Raquel. I am on TikTok as the same. And I will be having more coming out around like sharing a lot more around this book as well. So I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more from me (laughs) this month. Yes, absolutely. You're the best. I enjoy. I'm so thankful for all these wonderful conversations we're having this year on the podcast. So yes, go get the book. Go follow Raquel. So much more coming. And um, yeah, thanks, Raquel. As per usual, you're the best. Oh, you're the best. Thanks for having me. I love it. Thank you so much, Raquel. I love Raquel so much. And she's on the podcast a lot this year. And I hope you love her as much as I do. Let me know if this was helpful. Let me know if you struggle from eco-anxiety. We're going to be doing a bunch of posts about eco-anxiety on Instagram at Growing Joy with Maria. And go check out Raquel's book. It's called Self-Care for Eco-Anxiety. It's super giftable. It's like beautifully designed. It's wherever books are sold. And you can follow her at Our Infinite Nature, Raquel, on Instagram and then OurInfiniteNature.com. But the book has 52 practices for positive personal change through the power of nature. Raquel will be back for our summer solstice episode in a month or so. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, I hope you keep growing joy. 
plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, it takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're gonna get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.